Welcome to Relationships Q&A with Alan Robarge. I'm a psychotherapist and a relationship coach. Thanks for joining me. If you're looking for practical coaching conversations about real relationships, then you're in the right place. I take questions from members of our online community called Improve Your Relationships. And for the next half hour, let's brainstorm. Let's look at these questions from different angles, exploring our possibilities. We're not looking for one right answer. We're looking at what we can learn. The goal is to inspire you and get you thinking about your relationships. All our questions together point towards one universal question. We're all trying to figure out the same thing. How do relationships work? It is finally happening. The podcast is here. Episode number one. Thank you for listening. Thanks for checking it out. I have wanted to do this for some time and uh, finally got it all going. And here we are. Let's jump in. Question number one for episode number one is how do I stop? This comes from um, someone in the community. She uh, was really noticing a history of non-engaged, non-emotionally engaged partners. And, and the question is, how do I stop being attracted to emotionally unavailable men? And that's for her. However, many of us can, you know, you can choose. Uh, it has nothing to do with gender. So this applies to just being attracted to emotionally unavailable people. So before we jump in with a bunch of different questions and adding questions on top of questions, just exploring the idea, I would like to just my quick brief answer is it's about tolerance that there is an ability to tolerate uh, the non-engagement, the non-interaction, and that there's um, actually a reinforcing, um, making it okay. There's an accommodation that's happening and that you know on a certain level, hey, this is not what I want. I am not feeling it here. And in fact, what I'm feeling is disappointing or frustration or uncomfortable. And even for some people, it triggers fear or it triggers you know, this anxiety. You know, the other person's not here. I call this, uh, I call this there, not there. This is, this is a sense of absence. We are, we have a tolerance to be in relationship with the absence of emotional connection. It's a form of non-relating and non-exchange, but we are so used to it or we have grown up experiencing it in our families, our family history, family dynamics, family members. And it does not only have to be a family. You could have learned this uh, in uh, your more long-term uh, e uh, adult relationships as well. Uh, but I'm trying to expand the language that it's not only about the emotional component, it's about this idea of exchange. And that when we initiate and reach for someone in the sense of an emotional connection, we want there to be a reaching back, a responding back. There's the initiation. There's the acknowledgement and, and receiving and understanding the initiation. Then there's making a choice or some kind of response that initiates back or completes. There's a completion. And there's a lot of different um, metaphors or analogies that I'm going to use here. The first one has to do with this idea of harmony and singing and finding the right pitch. And if you're on the wrong pitch or you're, you're, you don't know how to hold a tune, you know, when people are out of tune and they're singing, 
you know, it's you you really know. You know, spend, go to go to go to Thursday night or Friday night karaoke at your local karaoke place, and you'll you'll very quickly hear, hear people who they cannot quite find the pitch, and they you know they're something's off. And that's what it feels like when we are uh, trying to match, mirror, uh, create an exchange. And there's, there's this back and forth quality of not only are we singing, but we really have to pay attention in order to create this sense of harmony, this attunement, this resonance. And we have to complement each other. In order to do it, we have to really pay attention to what the other person is also giving us back. And upon this question, how do I stop being attracted to emotionally unavailable people, is that you realize, you identify, you're not getting that much or a lot back. And in order to stay engaged or, you know, again, the language, it's a lot of a bit of paradoxical language. In order to stay engaged with the non-engagement, you have to uh, employ this incredible uh, probably very, very skilled, very, you're, you have this very heightened skill at being tolerant, of accommodating, of being okay, of dumbing down your needs, dumbing down uh, your, your wanting something back, that you have just been trained or you've had enough history that your brain defaults to repeating an habituated pattern where you tolerate non-engagement. Now, recently I was in the park or I was walking my dog, going to the park, and there's an open grassy area and it's a beautiful summer day. And I happen to see a mother with her child and the child's like three years old and he looks vibrant and alive and uh, uh, joyful. And they're playing ball. And that's, that's what this story is about. And I really want to break down. There was so much going on. And what's, what's fascinating is what I'm going to describe here is, is so incredibly simple. And that holds true of emotional connection and emotional exchange and emotional attunement and emotional availability is quite honestly, it's really, really effortless. And it's like a butterfly that just, you know, goes to one, you know, is, is, is moving around the garden. This butterfly is, there's, there's a lightness, there's an airiness, there's a simplicity to it. However, when it doesn't happen and it's not happening and you really have to think about and break down, well, why isn't it happening or what, what components are missing? And the reason why we're going to break it down right now is to address the question, you know, how do you stop being attracted to emotionally unavailable men or women or whoever, emotionally unavailable people is to be able to your radar system or heighten the ability to track and monitor where the breakdown occurs. And when you can do that, you are not going to employ the tolerance of accommodation and the tolerance of making it okay. You're going to reaffirm for yourself that this goes against your values and this is actually shutting you down, shutting you out, uh, creating a scenario where you get to be ignored or disengaged, not seen, not heard, not understood, and not from the place where you have to be in a kind of demanding sense, but we have, you know, to use the same language is going to sound a bit paradoxical. Well, we have to be in order to, to, you know, participate in emotional exchange. You have to show up. 
You know, think of two, think of the mom and the child. Um, you know, somebody can't just sit out on the bench. You can't, you can't look at mom sitting on the bench and the child standing in the grassy area holding the ball. And then we'll say, Oh, look, they're playing ball. Well, no, they're not playing ball. And you can't, you can't try to convince me otherwise. And how would we know if they are playing ball? Well, mom would be engaged. Mom would be there, which was the image that I saw, which is exactly, you know, what I want to describe here is that there was a real, an immediacy. There was a spontaneity. There was this uh, sense of alertness in their body language. And a really good example to, to compare the opposite of that is to think about um, a, a couple, you, you know, somebody who's dating, somebody who's in a, a partner relationship, and two people are out to dinner, and somebody is on their phone, and not paying attention, you know, trying to have a conversation, trying to talk, and the person that you're talking to is distracted, looking at their phones or out. If you observe the body language, you know, you just totally know this person is not paying attention. There is not a sense of engagement. But when we compare it to the mom with the child and the child's arms are outstretched and the child is smiling, uh, you know, the, the, the smile is as wide as the arms are outstretched. And mom's body language, mom is leaning forward. Mom wants the child to catch the ball. So that's the other thing that I really want to point down and break this down. Mom needs to throw the ball well and anticipate what would be the best way to throw the ball to maximize the child would receive it and catch it. And these are such good, good lessons. It's a very, very simple. But I mean, this is what happens. Emotional exchange and emotional engagement. We physically don't have the ball, but we have the same kind of immediacy, the alertness in the body, the spontaneity. And the same way mom needs to throw the ball with a sense of sensitivity to throwing it well so that the child can catch it. It's the same thing that we do uh, when, when two people are emotionally open and they want to practice being emotionally available to each other. They're going to uh, be a bit generous and be able to throw the emotional invitation in the direction of their partner so that the partner catches it. And there's this process of reaching out and then the partner reaches back, which is a form of responding. This is responsiveness. This is attuning to each other back to the idea of harmony, of singing and harmony. And then the voices blend and there's a shared experience. And the shared experience in the example of the ball is mom throws the ball, the, the, the child catches it. And there, there's this shared moment where it's all happening like choreography, uh, that it's in the immediacy of this choreography that we can say, oh, look, they're really responding to each other and they're really playing ball. And you have to pay attention. You can't check out in that moment. There is a, there is a window of time. There is a, a, a sensitivity, a finite window of time that you have to respond. You, you can't, if someone throws the ball, you, you pretty much have one second you know, depending on how far, far away the person is. You have one to two seconds to make a choice of whether you're going to engage back. Are you going to participate and catch it? You can't say in that moment, and in this example with mom, when the child throws the ball, mom cannot say, you know, to herself or just, you know, have the stance, oh, I'll, I think I'm just going to stand here for 10 seconds and I'll catch the ball 10 seconds from now. Well, you, we all know logically, well, nothing's going to happen. She's going to miss that immediacy. She's going to miss the actual, you know, 
ball being thrown. And quite honestly, she's going to ruin the game of ball. She's going to ruin the fun. And, and that's what happens is that people who are not emotionally present, emotionally paying attention, and they are emotionally unavailable. They're not, uh, connected or they're, 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 they're not tuned in to this finite window of time where there's an exhilarating aliveness where participation is necessary to happen within, within the context of, of the, within the rhythm of the exchange. So I'm really, really, in some ways, belaboring this, but really breaking it down in some very minute components. And the reason why I'm pointing this just to repeat, to, to, if you are attracted to someone who's not doing this, what this means is that you are overriding, you are ignoring the many, many steps along the way. This whole process, breaking it down into needing spontaneity, needing the immediacy, needing the finite window of time to engage back, needing the body to be alert, you know, adapting to the shifts of the changes in the spontaneity when, you know, when mom just throws the ball accidentally and it goes, you know, way over the head, the child's head, you know, then the child responds and the child turns around and starts running for the ball, you know, and, and it's that act of going after it that the child is, is reaffirming that he wants to stay in the game. And, we're, we're going back to two ad adults relating. You're with a partner. I again, it's not going to physically be that you're throwing. If you're sitting, you know, we're thinking you're sitting in the living room interacting. You're sitting in a restaurant. You know, you're not physically throwing a ball, but these are energetic invitations. Sometimes they're verbal. Sometimes they're an invitation. You know, if you, if you're speaking about, you know, I, I had something happen at work today. And it was a little upsetting. Uh, so we could think that's the ball. You just threw the ball. And you threw it in a nice enough way, you know, that, that, and then you're waiting for your partner to respond back and say, well, I hear that you, you sound, you know, something's upsetting. What's going on? You know, um, how are you doing? And th so the partner got it. And the, you know, so that's verbal. It could be nonverbal. It's just a look. You know, you have that look on your face. You know, it could be if you're upset, that look, but it's also, it's any type of, um, the, the communication that we use through body language, through touch. Um, and it's the whole spectrum from joy and happiness and, uh, you know, a sense of adoration for your partner. And the partner needs to see that and respond. But it could also be some of the more difficult emotions around sadness or feeling some frustration. And, and so then we need, you know, if we're just sitting there and our frustration, we're, 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 um, uh, emanating some frustration that we, we look a little grumpy. Uh, if we're with a person, it's not just about our grumpiness. That in and of itself is, is the invitation. That's the ball that is being thrown. And to have a partner who is emotionally aware, has some emotional intelligence. And here's the thing, has to care. You know, I mean, we're, you're listening to this podcast. I, I'm talking about relationships and quite honestly, um, I talk about relationships a lot. <laughs> so, um, I value this. This is, I find this interesting, important, necessary. And if you're listening to this podcast and chances are this isn't the first time you stumbled upon something related to exploring, improving relationships, creating healthier relationships, that you're interested in this too. So it's, it's the same thing with a partner that if you've picked someone who does not value emotional interaction and having to, to realize that this is a skill and that's to go back to mom and the child in the park playing ball. Mom is teaching the child a skill. 
and she is she is honing her own skill to you know a skill she already has or had and chances are her parent her mother her father played ball with her and she's able to enter that exchange so we want a partner who holds some basic curiosity and values wanting to enter the exchange. And if you notice that you picked a partner and you are attempting to sustain a relationship with someone who does not value this, you cannot make someone uh, create the immediacy of emotional presence, attunement, and exchange if one, they don't value it and they don't care and they don't want to, uh, but chances are then they don't even know how. So if you try to explain it, and especially this is, you know, listening to even me talk about it, it's pretty complex. It's, it's when it's executed well, it looks effortless and it's natural. And it's like two people's systems link up. It's like, you know, our circuit boards link up, link up or the energetically there's this kind of electricity and you just feel alive. And that's the look on the face of the little boy in the park as he's like anticipating mom is going to throw this really delicious, wonderful, fun ball towards him and he cannot wait. And he and the aliveness that he that he is exhibiting the aliveness that he has is not only for you know the sport of playing ball but th this is the this is about what it's like to be in relationship with mom and so if you notice you're with someone who does not uh, f access the joy and the possibility and the aliveness that it takes to create emotional interaction. What you're attracted to is non-interacting. You're attracted to someone who's there, not there. You're attracted to absence, the absence of relating. You're attracted to non-relating. So how do you stop being attracted to this? Well, some of it is look at your history of how this got set up and you might have to do some healing work around your family history. Most probably your family. It could happen in adult relationships if you were in a very long-term relationship with someone where the quality of interacting was so sparse and so stale and so uh, non-engaging you know, that that could have, you have trained yourself to be very tolerant. But for most of us, this really comes from our family. And so one piece to, to begin to work to be unattracted to this is to look back at our history and just realize how we were so together trained over the years and years and years to accept and not question non-relating and to accept and not question the absence of connection, even though we're a family, even though we're together, even though we're trying to interact and we could be friendly, lovely, nice people, and we are engaged in other ways as far as, you know, doing things and going places and participating uh, in some kind of everyday uh, being there, we're really not there. Again, there, not there. So one way to stop being attracted to this is to know your history of how you were trained to make this normal. And you have to undo that by saying this is not normal. And you were trained to tell yourself that you can tolerate this and that you accommodate this. You had to be okay with this. And now you have to work in practice to train yourself to actually be intolerant. And see, I, this is not, you know, I am not going to, the imagery here, if we're taking the mom and the child, the image is the child is just standing there by himself in this grassy area of the open field in the park, and there's no one there. And, and there's really like no ball being thrown. And this is, then you're going to have the image of a child basically, you know, playing ball by himself 
Or what the child does is the child starts imagining uh, playing both parts and that the child starts throwing the ball to himself, but the child could imagine, hey, well, if mom did participate, if mom did play ball, well, you know, this is what it would be like. Well, that's what we do in relationships as adults with our adult partner who's emotionally checked out, unavailable, not here, and we are tolerating, accepting emotional crumbs, is that in our ability to tolerate, we're actually accommodating through making up, imagining the other person is really, we're sort of, we're really filling in the gaps. And for some of us, we do this so incredibly well, we cross the line into a kind of fantasy. We don't even realize how it's such a one-sided relationship, but we are upholding everybody's part. And just imagine this imagery of, you know, you're run, like if you're, if, if you're, you're running back and forth, trying to, you know, play both parts of throwing the ball back and forth, you know, you, you run to, if we're at, if we're at dinner, with the one part, you know, and you go to the side of the table where your partner's on, you know, you, you fill in, you accommodate, you, you sort of make up, you know, how you can, you sort of just throw the ball to yourself and you just sort of assume that the other person is listening enough or present enough. And how to undo being attracted to this is to repeat for yourself that you can't do so much work. You cannot be the one to, you know, make the relationship last and to, to, uh, to, you know, like you're the only one. If I'm, I'm using a lot of metaphors and imagery here, but you know, you're the only one paddling the boat, essentially. You know, all the, you know, I'm sorry I'm mixing all of this imagery, but if you're the only one paddling a boat, uh, and you have convinced yourself to be tolerant of that. You're, that's not relating. There's not, we need the exchange component. Now, real quick, lastly, just to acknowledge something uh, to break down. If you don't have a sense of self, if you don't have a strong sense of, of conviction, of uh, holding true to your values, you're going to very quickly be able to reinforce tolerating the emotional crumbs, the lack of relating, uh, the emotional disengagement, because without a sense of self, you sort of don't know better and you can't stand up for yourself and you don't know your preferences. Having a self means you have presence. And in order to have presence, you have... Uh, you assert your preferences. I like this. I don't like this. I value this. I don't value this. I'm tolerating this. I'm not tolerating that. I'm putting up with this. I want nothing to do with that. I mean, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a presence and a kind of a, a meatiness, a, a, um, uh, a very robust, substantial, hey, this person exists because they have preferences. They know who they are. They know what they like. They know what they don't like. And when this happens, this strengthens uh, our own internal sense of self. And if you don't have that, it's going to be very easy to deny wanting anything better, which means you're going to stay in the old pattern of being attracted to the emotional unavailability. So to assert a preference, it gets broken down into three parts. And this is gonna, again, this is very minute stuff. I mean, we're, we're really breaking this down. But if you have a preference, it means you want something. You have to have a desire. You have to know your desire. So there's just a knowing. I want this. You know, I want a partner who's emotionally engaged. I really, I want this. And there's a desire to know the, the goodness of the wanting. Now, Right there, what I just said, there are people listening now. It could be you. There, there are many people who they don't even get this far. They cannot even identify their own want. They have been denied that. They were not shown that in their family. They were convinced they can't have a need or a desire. 
And then they also participated over the last so many years, ignoring themselves or ignoring yourself, ignoring the desire that you, you, when I ask you, what do you want? What's your preference? And you might just say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it, I don't know what I want. So right there, it's going to be very challenging to, to stop being attracted to the old habituated pattern of emotionally unavailable uh, interactions with emotionally unavailable people. If you cannot name with clarity your own desire and then fall into or drop down into the knowing of that desire, there's a clarity here. So that's just the first step in preference building, strengthening preference, which, which reinforces strengthening a sense of self. And you need to have a sense of self to change this pattern to realize that it is the self that is asserting doing something new. And so therefore, you need a stronger sense of self in order to move away from this old habituated pattern. So the first part of a preference, asserting a preference, is to know your desire and to be really, I can hear about, I want this. The next part is the felt sense in your body, the kind of stirring, something starts moving internally that says, I want to act on this. I want this. And I'm going to make, I believe I can change it and I believe I can make something happen. And when I say change it in this example, I'm not talking about changing the other person. I'm talking about changing your tolerance to intolerance. And so that you have the feeling, the desire, you know what you want, but then something stirs within you. There is a felt sense, a sensation. And this we're breaking down. This is the impulse. There's an impulse to act. So it's not only the desire, not only knowing what you want, but then feeling it and it, it, it engages, it links up with the part of you where there's the impulse that says, I'm doing something different. I am responding. I feel this invitation, this arousal to act, the felt sense, and I'm, I'm responding to the impulse. And that's the third part. The third part is we make the choice to act and there's, there's an actual, something happens, an activation. And when we're talking about moving from tolerance to intolerance, this is going to be a subtle internal shift. It might be experienced as a kind of disgust, that look on your face. You sort of curl up your nose and like, I, I'm just not, I just am not attracted. You know, this person might look good. This person might, you know, be a good companion sometimes. This person might be, you know, someone who helps me manage uh, my fear of being alone, or this is a good person to run to the grocery store with and hang out on a Saturday afternoon. But when it comes to real, honest, emotional exchange, connection, attunement, and availability, uh, this person is not the one for me. And I'm actually feeling a kind of disgust about all of the missed opportunities or back to the image of the mom and the child playing ball all the time that the ball gets dropped. That's what's happening. You, you keep trying to play ball with someone who's not even lifting their arms. And you just keep noticing the ball keeps falling down. And some people, they stop even picking up the ball themselves. And that's what ha back to number one, if we're talking about asserting preferences, the desire to know what you want. Some people deny what they want so much, they talk themselves out of ever even picking up the ball again. So let's do a little review. We're coming to an end. This was episode number one. Thank you for listening. How do you stop being attracted to emotionally unavailable people? Is to know the history and the origin of how this happened. And you were trained to be tolerant of these moments where there's actually non-relating occurring. And there's a bit of a paradox there. It's a bit of a crazy making idea to think that you really value non-relating, even though you say that you want relating. Now, we're breaking down what exactly is emotional exchange, all of the many components that that creates, the spontaneity, the finite window of time, the immediacy, the alertness, the engagement in your body, and being able to adapt to the moment 
and really, you know, and the, the, to play ball, to play connection, to be available. And so you, if, you can, uh, if you can break down the subtlety of this effortless, simple exchange, you begin to realize all of the many, many, many moments that you are ignoring that are not there. And that you can alert yourself to say, well, this is missing and this is missing and this is missing. And to stay in that place of awareness of how it's missing is what reaffirms for you that you want something different. That this is, this is not, this is not, you know, what you're going to continue uh, to, to pursue. And in order to have a strength, to pursue something different, you have to hold, be grounded in conviction of a sense of self. And one way to do that is to strengthen or to know your preferences. And preference building uh, can, can be thought of in these very subtle three areas, which is know the desire, feel the impulse, identify the impulse, uh, to the, the, the arousal to act, and then the last one is the activation, engage it and make something happen and that you actually affirm through the action yourself because you're no longer shutting yourself down. And so the repeated process of shutting you down, yourself down and denying what you say you really want is what keeps you hooked into continuing to stay attracted to emotional unavailability. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Relationships Q&A with Alan Robarge, where we talk about relationships because emotional connections matter. All questions from members of the, uh, all the questions here come from members of Improve Your Relationships community. And to learn more about membership, go to alanrobarge.com forward slash community. And thank you for listening.